But uh, the other thing I want to ask you guys um, is the main purpose of laws is to promote morality. What do you what do you guys think the main purpose of, of laws is in society? My take on it is so I believe the intent of law is to provide us a framework which we can peacefully coexist. Does it always achieve that? No, but that's the intent. <laughs> Because you can't please everybody. You think that was their main objective when creating laws, basically? Well, you got to think back then, that was a time of turmoil itself because they just had the American Revolution. They just overthrew a whole country, right? So they were trying to avoid future conflicts as well. That was, that was definitely a part of it. I think that is actually like the perfect, uh, you know, description of what a law is because, of course... You know, with every law comes, uh, you know, certain certain um, consequences. But nevertheless, you know, I wouldn't tie laws necessary to morality because there's certain laws that actually infringe. I feel like on you know liberties, like certain things that um, you know laws will touch bases on that you know it might not need to regulate. So I feel like law, laws really just regulate the status quo of what they what you want society to look like. So which is essentially what he said in different in different verbiage. Gotcha. But you don't feel it's basically promoting morality as far as laws? If you let it. If you let it. If you let it. Some of those laws are based on it. But other things necessarily don't boil down to morality. I was going to say, like, you can, like, if you, even if you just look at, you know, murder for existence, there's no, you know, way to look at murder and say, okay, if you outlawed it to where it is, or if you, if you were to strike the legislation that made murder, murder legal, just because the law says it's legal doesn't mean it's all of a sudden moral. Like, same thing, like, you, like, you can't. But you, are you sure about that? Because this really isn't what morality is, what we say it is in society. I mean, I mean, it's possible. Like, and as we that we could turn into that, is it possible? Now, I think that we could go. I think the counter to it? that is like morality is what you say it is because there's a book that is followed that essentially says what morality is. Like, yeah, yeah, and, and way laws are man made. But there's a guide behind what makes those laws. And I think, you know, a lot of, and there's not even a thing, a lot of laws that are made are based off of, like, religious texts. So if, re- if the religious text is still saying that, you know, thou shall not kill, then it's still a immoral, you know, act, whether the law says it's legal or not. I was thinking of, a, like, a post-apocalyptic type place where even... This man, hey, you want your post-apocalyptic <laughs> stuff, man? That's the thing. I don't think it'll ever happen. You don't think it'll ever happen? You don't think what? What's a post-apocalyptic world? Like, we're, like... You talking about Rise of the Dead type stuff? No, I was thinking more, like, uh, <laughs> technology fails on people and we have to basically live, like... Or we, Rise of the Dead, like, a world I mean, people type were living... So people were living, you know... Without technology, you know, not killing each other. But still, this is a this is a completely new generation. That that generation is old now, so they probably can survive. Like, oh, oh, oh cool, internet. That was down. That was up to begin with. What are you talking about? Oh, but I mean, the that's new generation that grew up on we, cell phones and iPads. I'm so you think because, because you think because as a generation that we're more dependent on technology, that we will abandon our our traditional morals and result to murder. If there's no guide to teach us. If okay, if we evolve, there's no guide to teach. It's not necessarily technology as far as like religion dies off or something like that. And then we go into the future, and there's no guide to teach us that. It could, I'm saying that could possibly happen. We could flip one on the switch. Like okay, we could possibly start killing each other and think it's actually moral. That's what I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. No, because I think like I get what you're saying, but I think even like even then, like you subconsciously know what's right or what's wrong. Like a lot of stuff you don't need detailed descriptions on what you should and should not do some things just you subconsciously know but you you're the same person that said you had to be you had to be taught to be civil though so you do have to be taught to be civil but i think you still i think even then like everybody has an internal rebel to where they know what is right but don't want to don't want to do right they get the thrill of you know doing what is deemed wrong 
so how do you know that conscience will stop them from getting that throw? Uh, Nothing might thing. not stop them from do, doing that throw, but we're still on the concept of if it's if it becomes moral based off of circumstances, it's still an immoral act, even with the circumstances being. But I'm also just saying, like, even then, subconscious will still tell you what's right and what's wrong. Subconscious. Even yeah. if that tradition of that society goes into the opposite direction, basically. I mean... Even if we're, looking, we're looking at the most we, extreme example. I know we are, but close. you can even look at like um, stealing like, the song, hmm? like stealing. No, I was gonna say like look. If we're basing it off of you know certain societies based off of that time, then I mean, even, just look at uh, you know oppressive states where people are trying to escape from. You know, all they know is oppression, but there's something still inside of them telling them that that's not the life they want to live. That they, they, they can go somewhere else. And I was even thinking of, like, you know, uh, one morning I was folding my clothes and I was watching a WHRO. And it was a story of this, uh, of this, in, of this uh, you know, of course, this slave, this uh, black woman who essentially, um, you know, murdered her kids because she felt that it was, you know, better for, you know, her kids to, you know, suffer just in that moment of death rather than, you know, staying alive and being, you know, slaves. Was this the one who left the oven on and burnt the house down with her in it too? No, she uh she jumped off a ferry and drowned. Okay. Completely different and then but no. But yeah, like even even in that moment she still knows it's an immoral act, but she still feels like she's justified in doing something because it would also be immoral for her to allow her kids to grow up in a enslaved environment. So it's just a, really, really what your question just becomes like a battle of the immorals. Yeah. Which one is less immoral? Now, I was thinking like culture too, because I mean, I, I'm just, we can leave that for another, honestly, another yeah. uh, subject. I mean, honest with you. But, at, least, at least let me know what you're talking about, what direction you're heading. No, I was basically going to reiterate basically, because I feel like he's going basically in the moment, like in the moment, your subconscious is going to be like, wait a minute, this isn't right. But I'm thinking it, over time, the culture of the United States go towards more towards that. Would your subconscious adapt to that same principle? That's what I'm talking about. Does it, you understand what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay, but we can basically go into more into that. Would you accept more normative behaviors? Yes, exactly. That's that's life goes on. So. But let's start the podcast, guys. All right. So <laughs> what's up, everybody? It's your boy Joshua Freeman. To my left, I got Mr. Brian Carey. So. To my right, I got Mr. Desmond Tillman. Uh, we on EP two zero. So how you guys doing? You guys good? Great. Fantastic. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So today we're we'll gonna be uh, discussing uh, prison reform. Uh, basically, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys: um, how do you, how would you guys go about prison reform? Or maybe you guys don't even feel anything needs to be fixed. It's up to you guys. You need to talk about it. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I think prison form can actually go back into the conversation we had where... Uh, which one was it? A different episode? Yeah, it was an episode a while ago when we were talking about does everyone deserve happiness. Two episodes ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you remember 18. how I used the example of, you know, when you take people out of a survivalistic mind state... Or mind frame, you know, they're able to achieve great things. And I feel like a lot of people that are in prison, you know, just like the masses, they've never been able to, you know, surpass that survivalistic mind state and never really get a chance to live life and are stuck paying the, you know, price for, you know, something that they did based off of the environment they were part of. So I feel like instead of, you know, putting young folks behind bars, you know, rehabilitating them and understanding that a lot of the stuff that they are going through and, you know, doing doing as a result of what they are going through, you know, as a result of them being a product of their environment and the system essentially has their environments up the way it is based off of said system. So I feel like prison form is really needed to, you know, address you know, minor offenses and actually get down to the nitty gritty of understanding why these crimes are being committed rather than trying to rule via punishment and thus deterring people from committing those same crimes because everyone's going to keep trying because people know they can get away with it. 
some people just get caught more than once and then pay the consequences for it. Right. And most people, well, I think I read that it's actually been proven that the length of the punishment or the punishment itself doesn't deter people yeah. or the severity of it. What deters people is the likelihood of getting caught. So if they know for a fact they're going to get caught, they're less likely to perform a crime. But that's aside from that. But I think you touched on something that's really important, too. The prison reform itself, that's kind of like a secondary concern. Yeah. Because it all starts with outside factors. How do people end up in the prisons in the first place? That's more important. Yeah, I mean, I know there's like a place for people who, you know, sub- I'm not even going to say subconsciously. Consciously know that they're defrauding the system or exploiting the system for their own benefit. And, you know, essentially taking from people who are more deserving like they do deserve harsh punishments but then at the same time you know you also have to uh you know draw the line between you know punishment and harsh punishment at the same time like i know what i mean by that punishment and harsh punishment is like i know i'm I'm not too really familiar with how like the prison system works but i know a lot of people not even a lot i know from what i know about prisons like in certain circumstances they get like one hour of outside time and everything else is within like the, the other 23 hours like within the cell aside from when they're eating and all those stuff mm-hmm. like i think you know guidelines need to be set on how you address those people because if you just continue to you know you know uh you know i'm not even gonna say captivate but you know keep the mind uh you know pretty much inside of four brick walls you can't really expect anyone to ever expand and understand life outside of what they already know. You're just essentially going to cause their men- their mental state to deteriorate until they can't either take it anymore or they just become accustomed to what their reality is. Kind of like what you were saying, where if we were going to an apocalyptic world, that they kind of just adapt to what's the new norm rather than what would either be moral or immoral or just versus unjust. Okay, so you... You do believe that you guys believe that jail prison is basically filled with labor, basically for yeah, like labor. Is. So neat thing about today. So I actually didn't. I understood the concept of the prison industrial complex, but I didn't understand the specifics of it, like how it was monetized. So I actually had to read and, and see how it how exactly it functions. And what you find? Were you guys familiar with that? No. Uh, prior to today. No, what did you find? So private prisons. What they do is they essentially make money from subcontracting. So let's say they have to have a company that provides the uniforms, a company that provides the food, a company that provides this. And for every customer, I think, uh, not customer, prisoner, for every prisoner, they get paid a certain amount of money. So let's say that it costs $100 to house inmates X, Y, and Z. So for each one of those, they'll say to the government when they're, getting, when they're making a bid for it or to establish that prison, They'll say, well, we can do that for $150 per prisoner. And if it seems like a good deal, they'll take it. And that's how they establish that. And then they, after they secure their contracts with the companies to provide the necessities and stuff like that, that's how they start making profit. So each body is it's kind of like a, a lot of these government jobs with contract work, how they make a profit. So you might get paid, you might get paid $25 an hour, right? Mm-hmm. But the, the government is paying the company that's so under contract, they're paying them 35 so there's still a profit margin. Or it's the exact same way. Yeah, so they get a profit margin with each prisoner. Yeah. yeah. Every everybody in a bed, essentially. Now, do you think that's a you guys think that's a class issue or race issue? A or? class or race issue. What do you guys think what type of issue that is? Or I think it's a morality issue. A morality issue. Because if you value money over over human's life, you're you're of course, it's a morality issue. Yeah, I mean, classes and racism probably is, is a morality issue in itself. But I said that's a subdivision of it. But yeah, yeah, specifics though. Like, how, how do you think it started? Do you think it started because class? It's just like we need to get poor people to work. Do you guys think it race? What do you guys think? What do you think? I think it's more race. I haven't thought about it. Yeah, thought about. No. I think it's more race. Um, basically. Well, after slavery was done, I can't even think about the specifics, but basically after slavery was done, they're trying to get a new way to enslave the black man and 
that's how the industrial complex was uh, basically set up, uh, basically as another an alternative way to slavery, basically. So that's how I was looking at it, and it started as a race issue. It could, it could be used like a class issue too, because it's not just black people in jail. It's white people so essentially, too. you're saying it started off what was race, but involved to something that could be you know looked at on the class yeah. scale. It's more yeah. profitable. Yeah. Okay. And that all dictates the way these way laws are set up. Yeah, that goes back to the main purpose of laws and everything like that. Yeah, so. it's like whether whether your intention is to with these prisons is your intent to actually educate people and reform them, like you say, it's the reform process, or to punish people. Yeah, what what you was talking about as far as having people finding people like the reason why they committed the crime in the first place. What would you call that? I think I said it before. It was like you need to rehabilitate. Oh, it was re- re- yeah, rehabilitate the mind, and gotcha. then of course the body will follow. Gotcha. You think that will be? You think that is going to be made the main objective? No, never, never. Mm-hmm. I think anytime like you have an ability to you know heal the ma- the majority, the minority that have you know essentially the the influx of wealth essentially will always try and find a way to avoid it. Because think about if you have the from what I always looked at it was the black man who was essentially a product of his streets who was able able to you know essentially climb his way up the you know social ladder and you know economic ladder as well is far more dangerous than a white man that was born into wealth because a white man that was born into wealth never experienced that survivalistic mind state and what it means to actually get something by any means necessary. They've been have they typically you know that that white man or even you know that black man that was born into wealth has had everything given and they've been given a blueprint of what they need to do, whereas a black man has had the or even even a white man that was born into you know um, a less than ideal situation, they have to figure out why and how they need to do it. So essentially, it's like a start from the bottom, and you actually you know utilize mentors, utilize you know even opportunities. And take the opportunities you get whereas if you're born into wealth if one opportunity passes you by then you know another opportunity is right around the corner whereas if you if those opportunities don't come in full then you might never know when that next opportunity comes and i think that's another reason like why um you know kind of like when black people better their situations they they're reluctant to stay where where they um stay where they grew up because they understand how much work it takes to get out of where you grew up. And that in like a split of a second, somebody can take that away, whether it's just out of that same survivalistic mind state that you just left, or just, you know, greed and anger. Like I really feel like, you know, not even people that that are, you know, subject to the hood, but even like people who grew up through middle class societies that necessarily aren't amounting to what their parents amount to go through that same mindset because you're, you're you're so used to receiving, 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 and then there comes to a point where you have to figure out how you got to get everything, and you go away from that, you know, that euphoria of just having mom and dad provide everything for you, to where now you have to figure out how to provide everything on your own, and you might not have necessarily got all those tools because in a middle class state, your parents are you know working 60, 70 hours a week just to even attain that middle class state, and there's not a lot of time spent molding the kids to achieve something because they're essentially you're essentially spending all your time at school and we know even in school systems a lot of you know people fly under the radar they never have that potential you know tapped into until they essentially figure out how to do it on their own and i even see that like within like corporate america itself like uh you know managers and directors they'll find one good apple to you know leech off of and then everybody else stays stays level like you know side a few pennies or a few quarters here and there but find that one person that stands out the most and then you just you know work them like a horse and then just really you know essentially give them their give them what you feel they're worth just to keep them satisfied as far as um rehabilitation how do you rehabilitate? I understand how you rehabilitate a murderer. I know, like, why you did it. Why? Why did you get in this situation in the first place? How do you rehabilitate like someone like a pedophile? How would you go about doing that? What do you guys think? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't can, know. Can you do it? Should they just be 
kept in doing slave labor, like, you know, forget these guys. They just, they touch kids. No. What do you guys think? I mean, can you? I mean, you be like, oh, yeah, I, I won't touch kids again. You leave, come back. I don't know. I'm not going to later. I've seen too many episodes of How to Catch a Predator. I'm not gonna be on. I'm not gonna be on camera trying to defend a predator or saying how you should rehabilitate a predator because I, I honestly don't know what their, like what their objective is at the end of the day. It's something somebody needs to figure out though. Yeah. Their objective. No, no, I'm saying like if, because this is a real life situation. I'm. Just, I don't. That's what I'm asking. I mean, I don't. I feel like people have been trying to figure that out. But can you? But I mean, can, do, is, it, is there something in the head? Like, do pedophiles is even? Do, do pedophiles it? even like really get time behind bars? Why you say that? Why you no, that? I'm asking. Like, do they even really get time behind bars, or they get like a slap on the wrist to begin with, and then they might get time behind bars based uh, off the, aside from their oh, like yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. not sure. I think like, it depends on the crime. I think they like some. I feel like a lot of it, you know, system is set up to essentially. allow people who have wealth to get off with just a slap on the wrist like yeah registering as a sex offender is you know it it damages your social image as well but how many times do you actually know the person you're walking down the street with is a registered sex offender you never really know so at the end of the day you can have somebody register as a sex offender but is there really any punishment other than what social damage you might cause them and the fine that they have to pay like I feel like you know, helping a he- helping a pedophile or a sex offender is something that has to be done from the get go, rather than allowing them, you know, the opportunity to you know essentially get off with a slap on the wrist and then commit that same that same act again. But what though? Same way you would rehabil- rehabilitate anyone else. Like a lot of people don't realize that a lot of their problems that they have going on right now are you know, deep rooted within, you know, whether it be childhood or uh, trying to prove parents wrong or feeling like, you know, they aren't good enough or feeling like, uh, you know, their career is failing or financial ruin or whatever. And they just begin to make subconscious decisions that they might not make have they actually addressed what's wrong with them and understanding that, you know, there there is a light at the end of the tunnel regardless. Like, I feel like a lot of people succumb to, you know, they're demons and then society punishes them for it and sometimes it's rightfully so and sometimes it's not but i feel at the same time like a lot of people just don't ever talk about what's bothering them because society has frowned upon it for so long and then you're stuck with like a like a damaged a damaged generation at the end of the day gotcha but yeah just wanted to know how would you guys go about that um, but I understand as far as rehabilitation for the uh, everybody else. Yeah, I don't know how you re- rehabilitate a sex offender. Though. I don't. I mean, so because I mean, least, I mean, you're gonna keep doing letting you, you, you can keep doing it in this branch and everybody else in another branch. I you, mean, they are non-violent. No, no, not really non-violent. You can. I mean, you put them in. You put them in jail with the same people. Of course, they're gonna. It's gonna be like a beyond scared straight moment. But once you get outside the jails, it's like. That fear isn't always going to be there. That fear is going to be there maybe when you get out. But as you progress and days go by, you are obviously removed further and further away from that fear of what happened. I don't even think the current prison system makes any attempts at education yeah. when it comes to just like crimes in general. Because it's expensive. Yeah. Think about yeah. think about how much you would charge to to be a uh, you know like a, a coach of some sort, like a mental health coach, or yeah, you person. know, like essentially, like just imagine if our podcast was to blow up. We wouldn't like charge nickel and dime. We would charge top dollar because we feel like we are able to reach a mess. Like people, you also got to look at like, um, you know, even with YouTube, like when you view on your favorite channel, look how many ads might pop up mm-hmm. during that during that uh, video. Like you, you got to pay top dollar for, you know, people for, you know, great quality coaches to, to re- rehabilitate people and you know, to actually get them to look at their flaws for who they are and, you know, to essentially let them know that their flaws make them who they are, but they don't necessarily define who they are. Well, if that's the case, we need to get rid of the guys that the prisons are there to reform people because that's not the intent. Yeah. Clearly not the intent. Because yeah. kind of like when we're talking about racism, the example of, you said, I forget who, who presented the example, but it was 
the child's friend comes over as a white child and uses the n-word yeah and do you use the opportunity to i guess lambast the child and criticize them, tell them never come over again or do you sit them down and have a conversation and educate them which one is more beneficial in the long run okay. all of us know that education is better right so there's there's none of that not after being made because yeah, even if you try and educate someone that doesn't want to be educated, that conversation is always going to be in the back of their mind. And it usually what happens is that person that does not want to be educated finds themselves in a situation to where now they have nothing. And they're just replaying all the moments that, you know, essentially someone tried to educate them on. Mm-hmm. And I think like it's that's part of like the, you know, survivalistic mindset that you can't teach somebody that's not willing to learn. And they always have the option, too, because it might not hit you right then might not click with you but later on you might change your mind about it you, you have to think about the all the people that get into prison I, I don't know the exact numbers but I'm pretty it's a high percentage of the amount of people that come out of prison and likely they recidivism go, right you ready to go back yeah. yeah go right back in so just thinking about that too I mean like think about it you put somebody in a cell and you're telling them to think about what they've done what exactly are you expecting them to think about yeah, not, are you not learning from anything are you like teaching them to disconnect with what they know and, and uh, you know essentially help them rebuild who they are so when they come out of prison it's not them being attracted to the same things or are you just putting are you isolating them you know and, and treating them as adults that you think they are and expecting a different product to come from it hold on not only that what kind of skills like are offered to those kind of people because you think about it, you go out into the workforce. I feel like blue collar, but even then, like... Typically, like, you, landscape and you think about... I mean, well, that's what they do. But if you, even if you think about, like, blue collar workers, even... And I know this just from, you know, what my... Uh, like, my dad has a landscaping company, and one of his, one of his uh, friends does the uh, contract for our neighborhood. And it's like, you can sit here and say, like, okay, we have a workforce that, you know could essentially welcome, you know, felons or anyone coming out, coming from the prison system. But then you also got to realize when they're coming from the prison system, they're not coming from the prison systems with, you know, valid license and registrations or, you know, valid anything. Like they're coming out of the prison system with little to no means to an end. So those jobs that those jobs still require you to drive to wherever the work site is. You know, no no business owner wants to have to go pick somebody up from home and essentially drop them off at the end of the day. Like they still want that autonomy to say, hey, you know, meet me here so we can do this work. And then, you know, peace out when you're done. Mm -hmm. Like nobody wants to have to babysit. And I feel like essentially, you know, the prison system just might be setting those those felons and everyone up to come out and just be babysat by a society that was never intended to babysit in the first place. Like, even look at the people who get, uh, you know, license suspended or license revoked. Like, you know, think about all the money that they have to pay to Uber to try and get the work or, you know, how, how much money they miss out on, you know, when they, when they, uh, when they miss shifts. Like, you're putting someone deeper into a survivalist in mind state to the point that they just might do something that they normally wouldn't do had society not put them into a black bucket or into a yeah essentially a black bucket to where there's no way to see light inside of the current situation that you're in like obviously they 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 did something to deserve the license being revoked but you teach them a different way rather than just taking license for you know one or two years because that's a long ass time like that's like 365 days is a lot it is short in the sense of when you're doing something that goes by quick, but it's long in the sense of if you're not doing anything, then it just drags by day by day. It's a substantial amount of time to send yeah. somebody back. Yeah. If, per se, like a ridiculous example is the child support, the way they did that. Like yeah. if, you didn't, if you didn't pay previously a certain amount of time, they take your license. So that takes away your means of transportation to get to working, to make the money for that. Mm-hmm. Which the, the logistics of like how that occurred and, and what was going on prior to that, that's beyond me, but I'm just saying that doesn't make sense because if you're already not making the payments, then if you don't have a way to get that money, there's no way you're gonna make the payments. Yeah. So I got a question for you guys. So you know Centoya Brown? Do you know who that is? Please tell me y'all know who Centoya Brown is. No, no, I'm not ringing a bell. She was just granted clemency. She had been in prison for 15 years. I think I, I think I recognize the name. Is this one of Kim Kardashian's work? Yeah, 
Well, she she was an advocate for. It. I don't know what, what they did, but I know she has clemency now. She'll be released like October, not October. Excuse me, August seventh. So after fifteen years of serving time in prison, because she she killed a man. So Centoria Brown, I think at the time of the crime, she was sixteen years old. She's being prostituted out by a twenty four year old man, and so she went to this hotel with this guy, a forty three year old guy. I forgot his first name. His last name was Allen, and this all happened in Tennessee. But so what what happened is. She said she feared for her life, and she ended up killing him. And she took the money and the guns and, and drove back with the truck. Yeah, to the so you, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, right? So she drove back to the to the pimp and gave him the guns and the money and stuff because she said she didn't want to return empty-handed because then he would have been upset with that, right? And what ended up happening? She got arrested and convicted, and I think she was she was to serve like a life sentence with 51 years without parole, without the possibility of parole, and she ended up having to serve 15 years before she was even granted her clemency when she was a minor. In current, current day law in the state of Tennessee, you can't be tried for sex uh, prostitution, sex crimes like that. You can't be tried under the age of 18. So given today's laws, she wouldn't be convicted. But I feel like the whole situation is was dealt with really poorly. Like it's, it's fairly obvious that that shouldn't have been the outcome. What's her name? Centoya Brown. Yeah. But so why is it taking so long for her to be free? I don't know. Because I understand. Happens. Well, my only guess is like bureaucracy. Where oh, we have to get the paperwork and stuff like that. Because it's like, what's the benefit of keeping her in jail for something that she's been forgiven for essentially? Because that's what that's what clemency is. There's different degrees of it. There's like a a pardon. There's a let's see, what is it? I'm not sure. Were they shorten the sentence? They commute the sentence. Uh, is that it? And then it's a just regular pardon. Yeah, she says she'll be released to parole supervision on August seventh. When it um, when people are in jail um, because of like lack of money due to like uh, like a drug dealer, for instance, how do you exactly rehabilitate them? This is one of the last questions. Think I'm about it. Think what all a drug dealer is is an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, how do you rehabilitate an entrepreneur? You give them the books and the means to to actually learn how to, you know, create a business. Like I, I know it sounds like really cliche, and you know, it takes a lot of work. Though. It does take a lot it of work, but it, too, and people don't have that time. It takes a lot of work to sell drugs at the same time. You said they don't take had that time. Yeah, people don't have that time. They have nothing but time in prison. Yeah, yeah. No, I was talking about as far as like uh, when you're trying to outside outside of prison when you're a drug dealer, you're trying to make the money. You're not trying to. You're not trying. You don't have time. Nah, what person. he's saying, he's. I get what he's saying. What him? Yeah. What you said? They don't have time. Correct. What me? Yeah. I said, yeah. But he's saying they have nothing but time in prison. I don't. so. <laughs> It's I like, pick your, oh, I was like, yeah, pick your, <laughs> pick your, I mean, I just, like, it came off to me like, oh, pick up, pick your poison. You don't have time to. No, I wasn't. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I wasn't trying to be a smart ass. No. <laughs> but it's like, so are you talking about offering those options to teach us people yeah. after or before? Because like, like, either or. Like, I mean. And where, where's the initiative? Because so like, Killer Mike, you guys know who that is. I know that, right? Mm-hmm. But you also look. They develop. I'm not going necessarily attacking Killer Mike, but a lot of people don't develop that mindset until they're later in life. So you can't expect somebody that's 18. That's true. But you have people who are ahead of you who already have done stuff like that, who know the path that it goes, and they provide. They're reaching out and giving you resources and telling you how to do these things. Yeah, but you know, so it's not impossible. It's not impossible, but everybody likes to run their own race at the same time. I understand. So it's like a pride thing. So he was saying in this one particular post, he said that. If you're selling drugs, okay, the idea is to get up out of your current situation. So what's wrong with taking $10,000, you make that, and investing in a food cart or something like that? Like you can easily do that if you're already making that kind of money versus staying in the game and then running the risk of, because there's only like a few set outcomes of that. So the but that's the looking at the situation from a bird's eye view. You're not necessarily in the situation. And but you're not like, ignorant of it either because people are telling you that. You're not ignorant of it, but nevertheless, you don't have the creative mind space to think of what you could do with it other than what you've been doing with it. But if you really want to get that situation, you're going to do it by any means, right? I don't think it's a mean to get out of the situation. I think it's a mean to better the situation. You don't think it's a means to get out of the situation? No, because if you sell drugs, you're still in the same environment you sell them the drugs in. It's See, all, is it a temporary all, thing or is it, you know, you're trying to do it retirement? I think everyone knows it's a temporary <laughs> thing because you get a 401k. 
everyone knows it's like either you know when you sell drugs it's either you do it long enough to either end up in, either, either dead or in jail but nevertheless like you can't expect someone who is not aware of what they have the capabilities to do to essentially just do it like you can you can read Forbes magazine you can read all the Google articles you want but if you're not able to essentially place yourself in the same rooms in the same environments to brush shoulders with the people who, who are able to give you um, you know these opportunities then you're going to keep to you're going to keep continuing can continuing to do what works for you so you only know what you know at the end of the day like you're ignorant to a lot and a lot of people are just content with being ignorant of knowing what they don't know because at the end of the day like it's it's really it's a really i'm gonna say there's a bit complexity to it but it's really hard to leave what you're comfortable with when there's so much uncertainty on investing in what potentially could be actually working so it's riskier to start a food truck then it's the garden was getting shot. It's not necessarily up. riskier. It's not necessarily riskier, but you know there's a reward when it comes to selling drugs, whereas there might yeah. be no reward with yeah. starting your own it business. It might be for nothing, you know? Yeah. What do you have to lose? They don't look at it that way, though. I mean, you, they do look at it that way because what you have to lose, I mean, it's, oh, a, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's a lose situation no matter how you look at it unless you turn it into a win. But nevertheless, you might, you rather lose, you rather die rich than die poor. At the end of the day, you have to die rich because essentially you die rich. You've been living the life you always dreamed of living. You die poor. That means you've probably either lived the life and you, you know, spent everything to where you don't have anything anymore or you never essentially achieved the life you wanted to achieve. So nevertheless, you rather die living the life you wanted to live rather than, you know, trying to do something that never works and then dying regardless of not necessarily you know, regret. It's, it's never. What, what if money is not the metric you're measuring, you're measuring the success of your life by? We're talking about drug dealers. I'm saying, but like, <laughs> do you do you, do you think that's their ultimate goal? Is just to continue to to sell and sell and sell and sell. Like, yeah, I, I, no I think nobody right. likes living if if the situation you're I'm envisioning before, before your description is like impoverished in the hood, right? Mm-hmm. And they're selling the drugs. Oh. No one wants to stay there. No one wants to stay in, in poverty. No man, I think a lot of people enjoy the the family aspect that comes with struggle. Ain't a lot of family aspect when you go into like corporate America and you have these businesses because at the end of the day, you develop relationships with them, but they're still clients at the end of the day. They're not family. Whereas, you know, you you go to the hood, everyone that lives next to each other knows everybody by first name. I can go to my to my crib right now and I don't know people that live three doors down from me in either direction. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you're in the hood, you know everybody that's around you. So a lot of people don't want to leave those situations because they know the hood loves them at the end of the day because you're on the same playing field exactly it's like even not, they like love you though like every time i think that we, we talked about that on the last like when we were referring to like jealousy and refresh like, my just, memory we just said jealousy is just confused admiration at the end of the day people and just you want said it that. i said well, i said i feel like it is people just want what you have so but they love you right yeah Cause y'all in the same environment. You go to a new environment, you can't you you can't guarantee what people want from you. You go into a you go into a new environment where people are able to you know essentially read you like a book and see what you know and don't know, and they just gonna rape you for what you for what you got. I think a lot of people have fear in starting a businesses and just being scammed, or starting a business and then not succeeding. It's easier said than done. I mean, even just like working with ADP, you know, one thing that we actually had on come across the screen today was like, you know, customers or our customers, essentially business owners don't wake up one day and say they want to open a business and it happens. Like, you got to think about the permits they got to get, the licensings they got to get, you know, essentially investing, finding, um, what's it called? Finding suppliers, finding mm-hmm. locations, finding staff, finding HR HR programs or even just payroll services, finding who's going to supply the employees with, uh, you know, uniforms or, you know, just just the whole nine. Like, there's a lot more that goes into opening a business than it does, you know, selling weed, selling coke. Yeah. But yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask you guys that, though. 
But anything else you guys want to say before I uh, just stop it? No, I, I actually I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I'm not necessarily arguing against it. I'm arguing why people necessarily don't look at it the same way. Because it is a it is like something that I wish more people would look at because essentially you're setting the positive example for what should be rather than what is. But then at the same time you gotta realize how hard it is to, you know, come out of an environment that is so comfortable. And I understand why you're saying that you're explaining rather than justifying yeah. something. And you chalked a lot of that up to ignorance, but people aren't as ignorant as what we like to think they are. Far from it. I don't know about that yeah, one. I don't, I don't know, about know about that, that one. one. I think a lot of people don't know what the, what they could actually do. I think a lot of people are like so uh In the back of your mind, you always know better. You said, in the back of your mind, you always know better? Didn't you say that also referring back to the moral code? You know when something's right or wrong? Yeah. But talking, speaking of morality versus speaking on like expenditures or ad- adventure in terms of your longevity oh we're referring back to like the actual like drug deal and stuff yeah. yeah 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 definitely but we also said when it comes to that that's like a risk that's a r- risk worth taking because you know every time it's like d- are you really hurting anyone or you might be hurting like a few a few people but it's never going to be on the scale of like you know well, I'm not even gonna justify that. That's me. That's me justifying it. I'm not gonna justify it on on hurting people, like tearing families to sad and dirt, because it happens. So I'm not gonna justify it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you good? You still? <laughs> I feel like he's about to go back at him. Or something. Yeah, because he, he he waited to the end to throw the to throw the, the nah, that, his, uh, that was just that was just on the back burner. Yeah. Uh, okay. I wasn't. What's that? What's that card? The uh, draw four? Nah, it was like Yu-Gi-Oh card, like the the blue drag, the dragon one. Blue eyes, white dragon. Blue eyes, white dragon. <laughs> Man, just had that thing back there chilling. <laughs> but yeah, we gonna get up out of here though. <laughs> what do you guys think about the t- uh, topics we discussed? Prison reform, uh, morality, and laws. Let us know, okay? Comment below, okay? Uh, but we see you guys next week. No, we won't. We will not see you guys next week. We'll see you next week, but we're not leaving just yet. So yes. we're not even going to That's news to me. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what's going on? What's the time? Nah. So this week is not even of an album of the week. Uh, as y'all know, Sunday was Father's Day. I think we'll be seeing this on Saturday. But it's actually, um, actually not an album of the week. You know, I said Victory Lap was going to be my album of the week for a long time. I'm not leaving that but uh there's actually this book my mom got me for father's day and i actually like have been immersed in it i actually like read it at lunch in between calls or you know on 15s by the water fountain it's called unfuck yourself by gary john bishop so book of the week book of the week well book of the week album of the week audio book of the week whatever you want to do with it i highly recommend it uh i actually uh I actually have like the uh, what's it called the ebook as well. You can get it on you know Amazon for twelve fifty five. I think on the Apple Store or uh, ebooks. Whatever what's the Apple thing called? iBooks, some something like that. Yeah, it's probably twelve ninety nine. Books and right. then I, mean, uh, I mean it's a it. <laughs> this is called book section. Yeah, it's, I highly <laughs> recommend yeah. ten ten out of ten. I enjoy it so far. So if you're looking for like the uh, you know like a self motivate or something that's not too well it is philosophical but not too deep to where you feel like you're hurting your head reading it it's a really good book to make you think so check it out cool. I'm gonna have to check that out check it out but yeah we'll see you guys next week yes <laughs> peace <laughs> Welcome to the show, go and take a seat Let's talk about the world while taking a sip of tea A bunch of brothers come together, that's something we love to see The company can't get no better, we come from running the street But we here now the vibe's all good, we survive We gon' try and show the world inside the minds of some visionary brothers We only got each other, we don't support each other Ain't nobody gonna love us We can talk about the violence, the silence, the mayas The state that the minds and the science defiance Living and dying and laughing and crying Peerless and heartache and quitting and trying that's real from the heart, truth in the heart To so come up in the future, we just gotta play a part Can we handle that? Let them tear us apart And fusion breakdown show, go and talk about your thought